Well, reports like that certainly do put our lives into perspective, and uh, aren't we grateful for the freedoms we have? Let's make the absolute most of them um, in our day. Please have your Bibles open, Mark 2 into Mark 3, three little scenes that we're going to be looking at today as we think through this title, Jesus versus Religion. Now, if someone asked you the question, are you religious, how would you reply? I might say something like, no, I'm not religious, I'm a follower of Jesus, which may come as a surprise to my listener, but it would open up the huge issue of the difference between religion and what it really means to follow Jesus. And it's noteworthy in the Gospels that the biggest clashes that Jesus had in His ministry were not with unbelievers or even with people who were considered deeply immoral. His biggest clashes were with religious leaders. And in fact, the immediate context of our passage this morning in Mark 2 is Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus seemed to get on very well with those who were considered the biggest sinners in society. And that is exactly what brought him into confrontation with the religious leaders. All of which makes you ask the question, what's the difference between religion and following Jesus? Because there is a huge difference. And the three scenes we're going to look at this morning from Mark 2 and Mark 3 capture the difference between being religious and following Christ. And I hope they make us ask the question this morning, am I just being religious today, coming to church on a Sunday morning? Or am I truly following the real Jesus as the Gospels present Him? So this passage begins by saying, following Jesus is about relationship, not rules. It's about relationship, not rules. That's verses 18 to 22. So the first in this series of confrontations between Jesus and the Pharisees is a question over fasting. Verse 18 says, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to Jesus, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? Now, fasting was a spiritual discipline from the Old Testament that was intended to reflect godly sorrow for sin. The Israelites were commanded to fast only one day of the year. That was the Day of Atonement when a sacrifice was offered for the, the sins of the whole nation. But the Pharisees had turned fasting into an onerous chore. They fasted twice a week every Tuesday and every Thursday. There must have been a lot of thin Pharisees around. And then they laid that burden on the people. This is what true spirituality looks like. And Jesus didn't want His disciples to follow their lead. How could Jesus' disciples fast when He was with them? Where's the godly sorrow in Jesus being with you? Jesus' relationship with His disciples was full of joy. That is how God intended it to be. Following Jesus is not first and foremost about rules and ritual. It is about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that lights up your life. In fact, Jesus calls himself the bridegroom here, a beautiful image coming from Isaiah in the Old Testament that points to a wedding day, the most joyful day in a person's life. That is the picture that Jesus gives here of our relationship with Him. It is a picture of joy overflowing. How can you fast, says Jesus, when the bridegroom is here? In other words, Jesus didn't come to bring misery into our lives. He's not cracking a whip over us, chastising us for our sins. He's the bridegroom. He's the bridegroom at a wedding feast where we are the guests. And in fact, you'll know that other passages of Scripture say that the church is the bride of Christ, not just wedding guests. Jesus delights over us with singing. 
The Bible begins and it ends with a wedding. In Genesis 2, we have the wedding of Adam and Eve. And Revelation 19 invites us to the marriage supper of the Lamb as the relationship between Christ and His church reaches its glorious consummation. That's what the kingdom of God, that's what following Jesus is all about. Not rules and regulations, but a joyful relationship with the bridegroom. I love the um, 18th century Puritans. We can benefit from their teaching greatly. I read them all the time. But they could also be a miserable lot. They used to go around wearing black robes to signify mourning for sin. And they frowned on musical instruments in churches, taking away from the solemnity of the word. And that gave a very gloomy view of what it looked like to know Jesus. When we find Christ, Jesus himself says it's like rivers of living water flowing up from within. Romans 5, he has poured his love into us by the Holy Spirit whom he's given us. That's the kind of relationship our bridegroom wants to have with us. Jesus then gives another image later in the passage to emphasize the point. Look at verse 22. He says, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the skins will burst and the wine is destroyed. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. So the Jews used to keep their wine in wineskins. But when the wineskin got old, it lost its flexibility. That's what made this such a brilliant illustration. The wineskin became rigid and stiff. And it was hard for the fermenting wine to reach full maturity because wine expands. And old wineskins can't contain it. And the old wineskins Jesus was referring to were the rigid rules and regulations of Jewish religion that were restrictive and joyless. But a relationship with Jesus is like new wine that expands and matures and reaches out to eternal life. And the, this new wine cannot be contained by the joyless legalism of Judaism. His new wine would burst out of all Jewish wineskins. So a relationship with Jesus is like being the guests of the bridegroom at his wedding feast. It's like new wine that reddens your cheeks and expands into eternal life. The question for you and I is, do you have that kind of relationship with Jesus? Do you want that? Because that's what Jesus wants for you. Some of us may have been brought up in church traditions where holiness was equated with just constant confession of sin. The more holy you were, the more miserable you had to look without any hint of joy or celebration. Now, of course, we need to take sin and God's glory seriously. And there are times for deep solemnity in the church. But the Bible also invites us into a joyful relationship with our Savior, the bridegroom. Listen to the Psalms. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Praise him with the trumpet, the psaltery and harp. Clash the loud cymbals. Psalm 42, which we're going to use as our closing song today. As a deer pants for water, so my soul thirsts after you, my God. I don't thirst after something that makes me feel miserable. There is an exuberance in the kingdom of God because we have found our heavenly lover. Or rather, he has found us. His love fills my heart and his new wine satisfies my soul. Following Jesus is not first and foremost about rules. It's about a joyful relationship with the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me and lives within me now every day by his Holy Spirit. And yes, we are called to personal holiness. But holiness is not something doer. In fact, Dougie's catechism said that this morning. 
Holiness is not something doer. It's something delightful which enriches our experience of Christ. Christianity is all about delighting in Christ. That's a great title for Christianity. Delighting in Jesus Christ. And the motivation for personal holiness is because I've experienced the love of God in Christ. And he is so much more satisfying than anything that the world has to offer me. In 1 Peter 1, Peter defines the joy that is available to every Christian here this morning. Peter says, though you have not seen Jesus, you love him. And though you you don't see him now, you believe in him and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Now that is the new wine of the kingdom. And if you're not a Christian here, and you think of God as somehow repressive and out to spoil your fun, then think again. Jesus is the most joy-filled person you could ever meet. And he wants to share that joy with you as he drags you out of the darkness of your own soul, captivated by sin, and brings you into his glorious kingdom of light and freedom. Following Jesus is about relationship. It's not about rules. We're not inviting you to a religion here today. We're inviting you to enjoy the new wine of the kingdom of God. So firstly, following Jesus is about relationship, not rules. Secondly, it's about flourishing, not restricting. It's about flourishing, not restricting. That's verses 23 to 28. In this second confrontation, the Pharisees were complaining about the disciples plucking grain on the Sabbath day. Verse 24 says, and the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, another brilliant answer when you consider it, Jesus said to them, have you ever read what David did? David, king of Israel. When he was in need and was hungry, and he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest, and he ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for any but the priests to eat. Now everyone knew it was against the law of God to do any work on the Sabbath day. But Jesus emphasizes that the aim of that law was not to restrict people, but allow them to flourish. The Sabbath day was meant to be a day of rest set apart so that people could spend time refreshing their batteries and worshiping God away from the daily grind. And they could remind themselves that God, rather than work, was at the center of life. But the Pharisees had lost sight of the human flourishing part, and they had taken these rules to an extreme, suggesting that even picking some corn from a field to have a snack when you were hungry was not allowed. That was considered harvesting. It was considered working. And Jesus' reply here is priceless. He pointed to a key scene in the Old Testament where King David and his men were hungry. And David did more than just plucking corn. He actually ate the bread of the presence, the consecrated bread in the Old Testament tabernacle that even priests weren't allowed to eat, and they weren't allowed to eat it. And yet David wasn't judged for it. God didn't rebuke him because David and his men were hungry, and human need, human flourishing trumped the rule. They needed food. And God's laws were all about people flourishing. And Jesus underlined the principle at stake in verse 27, verse that you'll know, I'm sure. The Sabbath was made for man, for man to flourish. Not man for the Sabbath. The regulations the Pharisees had added to the Sabbath day law, which was much more than the Old Testament commanded, they burdened the people and were stopping them from flourishing. And Jesus was returning here to the spirit of the law. And of course, what is true of the law about the Sabbath day is true for all God's commandments. 
The kingdom of God is not about restricting us, it's about allowing us to flourish. Now, of course, yes, there are rules, but those rules are there to keep us safe, to keep families strong, to keep communities enriched. So when God's law says, you shall not commit adultery, that's because God wants marriage and family life to flourish. He wants us to enjoy the sexual relationship that He Himself created. But God knows that the only way that sex leads to human flourishing is within the confidence of a committed marriage relationship that also provides stability for children growing up in that family. And all of us can see the deep hurt and the chaos that ensues when we pursue sex outside of marriage. Broken families and broken hearts when we have a live and let live kind of attitude. Teenagers sexually active, 14, 15, 16. How will they delight in the bride that God has for them later on if they've been sexually active and reached that deep, holy level with a person on a one-night stand? That's what we've made of sex. We've taken a holy thing and we've used it for our own ends and we stop flourishing. When God's law says, don't covet, don't desire what belongs to another person, it's because God wants us to be satisfied with what He has given us, which will lead to greater joy and flourishing than if we live inside the prison of our own unsatisfied desires. I mean, if I keep wanting the money or the status, or even the personality that somebody else has, it leaves me miserable ultimately. And so the command, don't covet, has as its end goal my flourishing as a human being, my being satisfied with what I've got. And then, of course, there are the obvious commands for human flourishing. Don't kill from the womb to the end of life. Don't kill so that society can be protected. And with bills passing through Parliament at the minute about assisted suicide, and people will ultimately, they will be forced sometimes to feel, you're not, you're not contributing to society. That's where it's going to go. We need to remember God's law, don't kill. Don't steal. Don't tell lies. Why? So that we don't damage our neighbor. Behind all the thou shalt nots is the ultimate goal of human flourishing. So in each situation of life, ask yourself the question, is this going to allow someone to flourish or not? The kingdom of God is about flourishing, not restricting, especially the number one command to love God. Do you know loving God is good for you? Worshiping God, we were made to worship Him. Living under His care and respecting His fatherly authority makes us flourish much more than going through life making plans and decisions without really knowing what is good for us or imagining that it's good for us and it's really not, and our families. Isn't it great to have the author of life leading us in these things? Being the captain of your own soul leads ultimately to death and destruction, not to life and hope. And following Jesus is about flourishing, not about restricting. Don't run away from the God who made you and loves you and knows how you function better than you do and who wants you to flourish. So, Jesus versus religion. Following Jesus is about relationship. It's not primarily about rules. It's about flourishing, not primarily about restricting. And thirdly, following Jesus is about soft hearts, not hard hearts. Soft hearts, not hard hearts. That's chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. The third confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees was again on the Sabbath day, this holy day. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand, and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath. That's what religion does, keeping a beady eye out to watch whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. 
Most scholars think that this was a deliberate setup. The Pharisees placed the disabled man in the congregation to try and get Jesus into trouble. That was typical of them. And they were using this poor man's illness for their evil schemes, all in the name of keeping the Sabbath holy. But Jesus could spot their hypocrisy a mile away. Verse 3, Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, come here. He was doing this publicly, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to kill? Now that should have been a no-brainer. But they were silent. That's where their rules had got them. And he looked around at them with anger. Jesus is angry at religion. Grieved at their hardness of heart. And then he went ahead and healed the man. Jesus was angry because the Pharisees were so fastidious about their rules, it trumped any concern they had for a disabled man being healed. And then just look at the reaction of the Pharisees to Jesus' miracle, where they go off praising God, saying, sorry, Lord, we were so wrong about this. They see a guy being healed miraculously in the synagogue, and then it says the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians, which is ironic. Pharisees and Herodians did not get on with each other, but they did for this. They held counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. That's what religion wants to do to Jesus, actually. They wanted to kill Jesus because he had healed a disabled man on the Sabbath day. And Jesus wanted to highlight here the issue of hard hearts. Being so fastidious about religious rules, we can't even remember what it looks like to love people. The kingdom of God is about soft hearts. It's about looking at with compassion at the needs of people, unbelieving people mostly all around us. And we have to admit that there is often a hardness of heart, especially in evangelical churches. I see it on social media all the time. Often from people who are purporting to defend the truth. But on the balance of truth and love, the dial is way over to the truth side. So I was reading just last week comments about a pastor in America who had fallen from grace by having an extramarital affair. And his church quite rightly made him step down. But some of the vitriol aimed at that pastor and his family and the church and from a whole group of other Christians just wading in, loving wading in, left such a sour taste. A fallen saint And a grieving family should lead us to sorrow, should lead us to search our own hearts and say, here, but for the grace of God, I go. Not throwing Bible verses around about God's judgment or see what reformed Christianity can do to you. So on the truth, love indicator, where is your dial placed? Jesus had just had tea with tax collectors and prostitutes, eating in Matthew's house. I can't tell you how scandalous that was. Table fellowship like that with a sinner was considered strictly taboo. As was Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman who had five husbands, you remember? Jesus' disciples were shocked that Jesus was even talking to her in public. But he approached her with compassion while not condoning her sin. That's not what this is about. He didn't condone her sin. But he invited her to drink from the waters of life. And brothers and sisters, we have to admit, we have to confess today that many in our culture have rejected Christianity because of the hard-heartedness of some believers who emphasize truth at the expense of love and are happy to remain closeted in Bible study groups condemning the outside world. How many non-Christian friends do you have right now? How many non-Christian friends are you pursuing right now? 
How interested are you in their struggles and burdens? Or do we just take pot shots from the outside condemning their lifestyle? How can our hearts be hard when Jesus died for sinners? How can our hearts be hard when there is such genuine human need out there? So this question, really, all of it, a lot of it boils down to how soft is your heart? Does knowing Jesus make your heart harder than you were before? How compassionate are you towards those who have no Savior and live in ignorance of the God who loves them? The prophet Jonah, Jonah could not stomach God showing mercy to the Ninevites, who were known for their great cruelty in war. They were known for it, barbarism often. Yet God sends Jonah to them so that they might repent. At the very end of the book, it's the only book that ends with a question. God says to Jonah, there are 120,000 people in Nineveh who cannot tell their right hand from their left. They are utterly ignorant of spiritual things. Should I not have compassion on all those people? Yes, he should, of course, is the answer. And so should we. On the truth love barometer, let's not be all truth and no love, all doctrine and no mercy, all study and no social action. John Stott said, our love grows soft if it's not strengthened by truth, and our truth grows hard if it's not softened by love. And hard hearts, of course, are a sign of the religion that crucified Christ. They went out to destroy him. So I hope we all agree when I say this morning, let's get rid of religion in this church. No more religion. Let's follow Jesus, drinking in the new wine of the kingdom as we pursue a relationship with him as we pursue flourishing in him, and as we pursue having soft hearts as we go out to a lost world. Amen. Let's have a moment of quiet, and then uh, we will sing our closing song as the deer pants for water. Be quiet, I'll pray, and then we'll sing. Father, help us, we pray, by your Holy Spirit, to have great wisdom as we look at the laws of Scripture, of which there are so many. But thank you that behind these laws, there is human flourishing. You want us to flourish. You don't want to restrict our joy. You want us to be full of joy while curbing our sinful patterns of behavior. Help us to see the law like that. And help us to enjoy our relationship with Jesus, the bridegroom of our hearts. Thank you, Father, that you have poured your love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom you have given us. Thank you that Jesus, God demonstrates his love towards us, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So I pray for anybody here who has, who has rejected religion and thought that that was real Christianity. Father, may they come to know the real Jesus, the man with the softest heart, the man who wants us to flourish to such an extent that we will reign with him forever in a new heavens and new earth, the man who invites us into a relationship that is deeper than blood. Help us to stay with him, to know him, to love him, 
and to imbibe his character in our hearts so that this church will be known not for religion, but for Jesus. Fill us with him, we pray, by your Holy Spirit, for your glory. Amen. Amen. I've picked a slightly older chorus to finish with this morning um, because it expresses one of the heights of emotion in a relationship with God in the Old Testament. Psalms are full of this. As a deer pants for water, so my soul thirsts after you. You may even feel uncomfortable singing that. That's maybe not a character. Thirsting after Jesus, longing for him. May we learn what that looks like in our lives. That as we pursue all the laws that he set in front of us, we may flourish and know him, the bridegroom of our hearts, as a deer pants for water. We'll sing that together, then our service will be done. Remember Cafe One, um, tea and coffee afterwards. If you're new here, please stay behind. We'd love to get to know you more, and let's share real fellowship and joy together as God's people. We'll stand and sing as the deer pants for water.